It's a great pleasure to be here. I've um, just arrived back yesterday from one of the 30 countries I've been to in the last 12 months teaching for a five-day course in New Zealand. Interestingly, um, a group in New Zealand and a group from Victoria, Victoria No-Till, uh, have sort of combined for this conference in New Zealand. But it was very similar to the kind of work you guys are doing, and it's a great privilege to be amongst uh, such forward-thinking people. My journey began in an unusual way. I, I, um, it was kind of a life-changing scenario. I had a young daughter who was hit by a car outside of Yumundi School, a four-wheel drive, a six-year-old hit by a four-wheel drive doing 120, so you can imagine the mess. She was loved books, and she had 30 books in a backpack, and that's probably what saved her. But she died a couple of times in hospital, and then was in a coma for three months, flickering in and out, and then stabilised. And what you don't factor in in that scenario when you're an organ donor is that people are going to come on a daily basis and say, little Susie's waiting on her eyes, and little Jane's waiting on her kidneys, and whatever other harvestable organ. And I just hung in there and refused, which I was criticised for by some people. Um, but... Anyway, she stabilised and then all the machines she'd come to know and hate started beeping and they said, this is brain death approaching. And I am not conventionally religious. I, I, I think the religion's got a few things to answer for in a few places, but I don't have any doubts about there being something out there. And I did, for the first time in my life, I kind of made a deal. I said, look, if she survives against the odds, I'll do something of value for the rest of my life. And 20 minutes later, she came out of the coma and uh, made headline news across the country as the miracle child and I had a sleepless night I've got degrees in psychology and sociology but had developed a passion for soil science I had the sleepless night what was I going to do of value and figured that you know when I thought about it during that night that the soils we are what we eat and what we eat comes from a soil that really is a shadow of what it used to be so I decided to become an expert in nutrition soil plant animal human didn't realize at that point the profound link between soil and climate change, and it's that link that is driving me like a lunatic, meeting at governmental level. I met with the Minister of Agriculture for a few hours in, in, in December in, in um, the UK and Modi and, 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 and a few others, uh, just trying to frantically get this message out of the urgency of the story. And so it's difficult because a keynote presentation, and I, if you've attended my courses, you'll know, and you'll know in half an hour's time, why they call it drinking from a fire hose, because you're going to get a lot of stuff. If you had a few drinks, it might be hard to hang in there. But, um, but I break that up with humour and so forth. And this is the start of this presentation is pretty heavy going, but there's good news at the end of it, because you're going to know about some solutions to address some fairly serious situation that's happening as we speak. So what we're talking about in this presentation, it'll be a little lighter tomorrow, but so it's not good timing. I don't feel that comfortable with it. I might even finish it with one of my very outlandish jokes, but we'll see if I get done in time. So the Anthropocene, what we're talking about, is a new epoch for the, where for the first time in the planet's history, we've got a single species that's de determining the planet's future. The humankind is now the dominant influence upon both the environment and the climate, but unfortunately, little of that impact is positive. So what I argue, essentially, is that nature is a perfect blueprint and we were supposed to learn from that blueprint. And if you look at the definition of the word science in Webster's Dictionary, you'll find that definition is adherence to natural laws and principles. And when we look at how we've approached a great deal of science, whether it's medical science, veterinary science, agriculture science, uh, it hasn't really qualified for that definition in many instances. So one of the issues here is if we look at the etiology of the word humus and human, we find that they mean of and for the earth. And ironically, the word humility means pretty much the same thing. And it's really our lack of humility, that's why it's ironical, that we've brought ourselves to a point where there are actually quite a few commentators are saying that there's 10 or 15 years left. And that's an extreme thing that I don't subscribe to, but there's actually, I had a professor attend my course in the UK in November I went to dinner with him. He said he heads the scientific think tank that embodies the fairest and brightest scientific brains in the UK. That's his take. He said that one in five of them believe there's no people here by 2030. That's how serious some people think the story is. I don't subscribe. 
But let's talk about the storm drivers because there's not just one thing, there's six or seven, and then we're going to talk about what we can do to change those. Uh, the first of them we're going to talk about is the alarming loss of precious topsoil. We're losing topsoil at a rate of 7 to 12 tonnes per hectare, and according to Professor Ratan Lal, who's now considered the most qu quoted scientist on the planet, bri brilliant American soil scientist, uh, submitted a body of research a couple of years back. At that rate, we've got 60 years and there's nothing remaining. We need to actually understand that this, you know, if you compare gold and silver and lithium or platinum or whatever, in comparison to that thin veil of topsoil that feeds us, it is mind-bogglingly important. It's not something we can treat like dirt, and that's very much what we've done. We've seen with that loss of topsoil things like algal blooms, and I was recently in the US, uh, you couldn't even put your toe in the water because the ocean was green and toxic, and that's the case even in New Zealand where I was last week where there are whole rivers and lakes that people look over lakes that no one can swim in and someone's dog swam in a lake uh, 100 metres from their house, this beautiful lake, they look on the dog died five minutes later with algal blooms. Algal blooms are about, people say, a phosphate erodes, phosphate doesn't, sorry, phosphate leaches. Phosphate doesn't leach, it erodes with topsoil. And soil loss is accelerating in every country I travel because many countries say we still get the same 200 mils or whatever, but you get it in two events rather than 10 events. And so you better have that soil protected because the loss of topsoil is totally about the loss of the glue that holds those soils together. When our whole coast is covered in a red dust as it was several years back, the Opera House, my house, a thousand k's away, my White House had to be water blasted right up to Cairns. That was trillions of tonnes of topsoil lost from South Australia. Dust storms, when rivers run brown, that's a loss of the glue that holds those soils together. So number two in our story, and it's very appropriate to this gathering, is the mismanagement of water. Water is rapidly becoming the new gold. The Bush family recently bought 500,000 acres over the largest aquifer in South America in recognition that the old gold and that whole deal is changing, but it's poorly managed, this precious resource. Trillions in this country are lost through evaporation as we see each summer became, becoming more heated than the last. There's a large carbon footprint often in moving the, the water from the farm and applying a flood irrigation, which really shouldn't probably be there at this point. But centre pivots overhead are more losses. Uh, we need to you know, really, really embrace concepts like drip and mulch and cover crops and so forth if we're to struggle to minimise the impact of the droughts that are choking many areas, not just in Australia. We're now sourcing. I was in India and I had a, a mining engineer who asked to have, uh, have a meal. And uh, he was talking about something so basic. I've got friends in the Central Valley, who, one, one friend, Edwin, who's just put in three bores at $600,000 a bore, and he's into water no one's been in before, and many people are at great depths. And as this guy pointed out, that water didn't form in one lifetime or a hundred lifetimes. It was drip by drip through each rock layer for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, and we don't get it back when it's gone and it's gone in many instances, so you can start understanding the concept of water becoming the new gold. So number four is the loss of biodiversity. So if we're to work with nature rather than against her, then we say, okay, what's the central principle of this thing called nature? And what we find, without the slightest trace of a doubt, that the central organisational and operational principle in nature is the concept of biodiversity, and our embrace of monoculture is totally contrary to that central pr principle. Understand that plants feed the microbes beneath their feet. And we know that they produce glucose through the most important process on the planet called photosynthesis, and they pump half of that glucose down to the roots, and 60% of that half is then pumped out from the roots to feed the army of organisms waiting for their daily feed. So they're at the nexus of the single most important process, and there is nothing comes close because that's the building block of everything, including every one of you here, is the glucose building block, the basis of all carbon chemistry. That's where it comes from. And there at the nexus of the most important process is the most important principle. The plant gives away. Why would you give away 30% of your basic building block? Because that principle is give and you shall receive. In return for that glucose gift, the organisms 
now energize, fix nitrogen, solubilize phosphate, protect from disease. Every mineral has a micro behind it. Nitrogen fixes, phosphate solubilizes, manganese reducing organisms, iron reducing organisms. That's how the deal works. Uh, and so every plant doesn't just feed glucose, it laces that glucose with whatever it requires to stimulate the organisms that will deliver the requirements specific to that plant. If you're a banana plant, and if there are banana growers here, no doubt there are, they have a really high need for manganese, so you lace your glucose to stimulate manganese-reducing organisms. So basically, every plant feeds a different group of organisms, and the more plants you've got, the more biodiversity above ground, the more biodiversity below ground, and that is how it works and how it should work. And so the way that we can counter the mistake we made with choosing one plant that feeds one group of organisms and one group of insects, and we really select for our own problems, the solution to that is to come in with what has become a, a massive global phenomenon, and that, of course, of course is the concept of multi-species cover crops. Now, one of the biggest findings, and I know that you've... Sorry, I just have a mouthful of this water. I know that you've talked about this. Uh, this morning I wasn't here, I only arrived at lunchtime. But one of the biggest findings, and one of the biggest excitement in the 59 countries with teams of agronomists that we work in across the globe, we are more likely to see photos of someone's multi-species cover crop than we are their main crop because they know what they're going to see at the completion of that cropping cycle. And so the finding, which comes from Dr. Adamir Caligari, with this cocktail cover crop concept, is if you can have five species, and more than one of each ideally, in that cover crop, there is something almost miraculous that happens. Ron Nichols, who's a friend of mine who's the head of the Soil Health Division of the USDA, he went out to investigate. What is it? You can push a penetrometer to the end when you can only push it down to 15 centimetres previously at the end of a four-month crop cover cropping cycle. What is happening with this multi-species concept? And he, just got, he quantified that the response only happens when the five species, grasses, cereals, brassicas, legumes, and the missing link almost always is called chenopods, or the Americans say kinopods. Small group of plants, everything from the beet family, amaranth, quinoa, and spinach, that's it. And you need 1%, that's all. So you might say, well, that's expensive to put that in, because sugar beet's cheap in the US, but we don't farm sugar beet here. But 1% is not a big story. But what he discovered was that when, and only when, the five plants are included, there's a messaging begins between the roots, and the roots begin pouring out substances called phenolic compounds. Now that's why we drink green tea, because that group of antioxidants is super powerful at a cellular level for us. And it turns out that the trillions of trillions of, of single and multicellular creatures beneath the soil perform in the same way in the presence of this outpouring of those antioxidants, and they literally go into hyperdrive. And so we're, we're kind of compensating for a mistake in a sense. So there's a few of the kind of crops, we'll talk about this in more depth tomorrow, uh, of the kind of plants that you might have, and you can pick out your five. And of course, what we're looking at here, if we're talking about um, where is the kinopod, the missing link, uh, it is the sugar beet in the mix. There it is there. But we can see the five species, and ideally two or three or four of each. It's all about the more the merrier is the principle in nature. I, I just did a 20 species cover crop on one of my two farms, and the change in that soil is, you can step outside of where the cover crop was, and it's just a, a, an absolutely super exciting. Many people say there's more money in a bag of seed than there is a, big, a bag of fertilizer. I sell fertilizer, I'm telling you, there is more money in a bag of seed. I just come from a conference where speakers, uh, farmers from four countries talked about their results with multi-species cover cropping. And uh, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Number five, in the grim list is the insect Armageddon. I don't know how, how many of you are familiar about this emerging issue, but there are 900,000 different species accounting for 80% of all known species on the planet, hugely important part of the food web upon which all of us are dependent. They aerate our soils, they pollinate our crops, they control pests, they recycle minerals, they're part of the decomposition process building humus, and they're a protein source for livestock, humans, and sources of things like silk and honey. But you might or may not have seen the, the horrifying research that I, the guy who I heard reporting that burst into tears describing the research, where after 27 years of not monitoring, far, not monitoring farmlands, but monitoring parks and reserves in Germany, 27 years counting flying insects, 
they reported a 75% reduction. There, there have now been nine studies globally that have found similar, between 70 and 80% reduction of fly insects. The test that everyone suggests that you conduct on your own in your own life is the windscreen test. And I can do that when I drive from my farm on the Sunshine Coast to my second farm at Sandthorpe, where I would have stopped two or three times to clean bugs off just a decade back, and there's one or two splats. Christmas beetles flooded my veranda. Wet, following a dry period, a wet night, flying ants would fly, and none of those things have been there for two to three years. I don't know if you've noticed it. There's a huge change underway, and it's so serious, it's ridiculous. We've all heard of colony collapse disorder that took out 52% of the hives in the US to the point that beekeeping is no longer a viable profession in the US. This is a bigger story than that and something that we desperately need. We, we know the basic player. The neonicotinoids turn out to be more powerful as insecticides than DDT ever was and many countries have banned them but we're not one of them at this point so we have to reconsider that. Number six is the story of nitrogen abuse. So let's look at that story. Agriculture and horticulture together account for 80% of the nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. And you might say that's not a big deal. That's only 5 to 6% of, of that blanket of greenhouse gases that sun moves through, warms the earth, the heat moves back. That blanket is absolutely essential because we don't exist without it. We've, it's been demonized as some kind of evil thing. The greenhouse blanket is what creates a livable climate, but we've made it a little thicker than what it's been previously. And we talk about CO2 because it is three quarters of the gas there, but, uh, and only five to six percent is nitrous oxide, but it's 310 times more thick near that blanket and no one's talking about it. 80% comes from agriculture. It is so easy to improve nitrogen management and to do it better than what we're doing. And there's some really simple concepts, and I haven't re really got time to, and I'm just gonna rush through this because there's so much in there, but I'll just touch on one simple concept relative to the improvement of nitrogen management, and that involves the foliar spraying of urea and understanding the mechanics of that approach. You take urea, you put it in the soil, it's the amine form of nitrogen. Immediately, the urease enzyme kicks in, converts it to the ammonium form, it sits there with one little charge on the little Velcro sites on the clay collar, it's held there. If there's warmth and moisture, nitrifying bacteria come woofing in and convert it through to the nitrate form, rips into the plant, stores in the leaf, and now it needs to be converted to what we all want, which is protein, which drives the, the protein-driven immune system of plants, animals, and humans. We want protein, not nitrates. That conversion is hugely energy intensive, from nitrates through to a protein, but most of the energy is in the first stage, from nitrates to an amine, then it's real easy, amino acid protein. Wait a minute, didn't we start this journey as an amine? Isn't urea an amine? Yes, it is. When I travelled to Cuba, who won the Nobel Prize for Sustainable Agriculture, wondering how can they be out yielding us in cane, they're fully spraying urea amongst several strategies because you're taking 15 times more efficiently, 12 to 15 times more efficiently through the leaf, the amine form, combining it with humic acid to get a better uptake and buffer any potential burn, and you've got that immediate efficiency that is incomparable. There's no volatilisation, there's no loss of nitrogen, there's nothing, and it's as effective. A, a 10 to 15 kilogram foliar spray of urea is about a 60 to 80 kilogram side dress in efficiency, but there's none of the losses. And there's so many strategies that we teach that all of us can look at and embrace. So when we radio, we say, how do we lose three quarters of our, of our organic matter? Because we used to have 5% in 1900, we've now got 1.5%, and that's a massive contribution to that blanket. So if we look at those figures, we see that since 1860, with all, all that we've done, coal fire power stations, industry, 7.4 billion lungs breathing out CO2 and many more animals doing the same motor vehicles, that's 250 gigatons. But taking 5% down to 1.5% organic matter, that equates to 476 gigatons. The largest story is what was in the soil is now in the atmosphere. And when we change how we farm, and we step into what is the carbon cycle, where carbon cycles between soil, living things, and the atmosphere, and we put it back in the soil, we put it back from where most of it came, and we can save the day, and many, many scientists are now recognising that humus literally can save the world, and the only people, the only people that can save the day are you people sitting here. Our farmers become, have always been, there's nothing, there's nothing comes close to the importance of farming as a profession, it's just become a hell of a lot more important. 
There'll be, in the quite near future, mark my words, remember this night, within five years, there will be photos of farmers on those magazines currently adorned by worthless celebrities. Watch, watch, because everything is changing as we speak. Number seven, of course, is the spectre of global warming. And what we've got to recognise is where we are and why we're there. And where we are currently, it literally, is minimising a hangover. It took us till almost 1900 to get our first billion, and then we sped up considerably, and just short of 1950, we hit two billion. Then we went into hyperdrive. That's the elephant in the room. Between 1950 and 2020, just 70 short years, we went from two billion to 7.4 billion, and we fueled that massive expansion in human enterprise uh, with ancient sunlight. And you can say, what are you talking about, ancient sun? I'm talking about the proceeds of photosynthesis from millions of years back in the form of coal and oil, and of course, what we lost from our soil in the way that we farmed that soil, the way that we mismanaged that soil and put two thirds of the largest carbon storehouse on the planet up into the atmosphere as CO2 as part of the carbon cycle. So this, of course, has created an unparalleled climate crisis and where we're at is facing a massive question, how do we perform an urgent rescue on a planet threatened with a man-made fever? So our only response to this point relative to climate change has been to talk about reducing emissions. Someone's got to tell someone sometime that if we cut emissions tomorrow morning, we wake up and say, yes, the shit's at the fan, we've got to do something, and we cut emissions tomorrow morning by 100%, what happens? In 200 years' time, we drop down to the levels of CO2 that we had in 1975, which is still too high. This thing's been happening 10 decades, we're only noticing it now, because it's getting a little more serious. The oceans continue to heat at those levels, the oceans continue to acidify, and you won't find one of the 2,500 IPCC climate scientists will tell you this 200 years. And what, all we've done is, it doesn't mean it's not a value to reduce emissions, and you might say, is it all over, bar the shouting, and it's not. Uh, the answer is a resounding no, but there are five understandings. We can't make new carbon. It's the same carbon molecules that have been here since the start of all time. They cycle between the soil, between living carbon-based life forms in the atmosphere. That's the carbon cycle. The lion's share is in the soil, and two-thirds of that we went from 5 to 1.5%, 2%. Two-thirds is now in the atmosphere, thickening the blanket, trapping the heat, and changing the world very dramatically in which we live. So how do we address that issue? The chief uh, carbon load is the chief culprit. We mentioned the 250 versus 476 came from our soils. We put it back from where it came. We build organic matter and we're stepping into the carbon cycle and effectively sequestering carbon that otherwise would have returned to the atmosphere. So what kind of things do we need to look at? The biggest thing that I got out of this conference with farmers from four countries is this recognition that what's lacking in our soil is a creature called fungi, beneficial fungi, saprophy saprophytic cellulose digesting fungi. You can take your lawn clippings and pile them in a the corner and come back, uh, you know, <laughs> An hour later, and that pile of lawn clippings has already started to warm. When you come back with a second barrow full of clippings, that's bacteria breaking down and chasing the nitrogen-dominated chlorophyll in those clippings in a simple, easy-to-digest material, and you've got compost three months later, and you put it on your soil at the rate of 100 tonnes per hectare on your garden, because you can, it's just a garden, and you come back six months later, and it's gone back from the three shades darker to its original colour. It oxidised and went back up as CO2. And the difference between fungal dominated and bacterial com dominated compost. Fungi will take that humus created by bacteria, they'll make some themselves, they'll wrap it with their hyphae and create a clay humus crumb and that changes the whole nature of the stability of organic matter. Now you've got 35 years, which will outdo many of us in this room, 35 years of stable carbon in the soil, keeping it in the soil and out of the atmosphere, but it involves creatures called fungi. And when you're talking about, whether you're talking about grazing or, 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 or orchards or sugarcane, it's the same scenario. You can say, oh, sugarcane's bacterial dominated. Yeah, it's supposed to have slightly more bacteria than fungi. Have a test, have a soil life test. You've got no fungi. You've got to adopt a series of principles to bring back the creatures that will create the crumb structure, that will create the infiltration, which is one of the most important words in the brave new world of climate change scientists, how much of your rain comes in and how much holds in. That's called infiltration, and that's about fungi and fungi creating. Bacteria spit out a little sticky slime and create a mini aggregate, and fungi wrap it up with their hyphae and create this larger aggregate, and that's the essence 
of a soil that can breathe. And that's the main thing you're doing. The most important substance in growing a crop is called oxygen. How freely does oxygen move in, be used by the organisms, crowd around the roots waiting for their daily feed. The roots themselves utilise oxygen. Then they breathe out and CO2 moves up and the plant leaves waiting with tiny little mouths called stomach to suck it up, combine it with water and sunlight and that's how you grow stuff. The better you manage gas exchange, the better you grow stuff. And gas exchange can't happen without fungi. They create the larger particle that, uh, aside from their multiple other benefits, that's a principal driver. And none of you seem to be doing much work on that front. And I'm saying maybe we need to look at it. Of course, you might have heard of mycorrhizal fungi. Burrows into the plant root, expands out, and gives us a thousand-fold increase in root surface area. Mining minerals that are really immobile, like phosphorus and zinc, breaking the bond between calcium and phosphate, producing seven known biochemicals to stimulate immunity and so forth. But the big finding came from Dr. Sarah Wright in 1996 when she found that microvisal fungi spit out a substance called glomalin that is a triggering mechanism for 30% of all the humus in the soil. There's probably no creature more important at this point of time on our planet than that little creature, and 90% of them are gone. Cost you 20 bucks to put them back. But you can't just kill them off with the same things you killed them with in the first place, so we have to change the way we do things. So, meeting the challenge. What is humus? I'm standing on the steps of uh, City Hall in LA to addressing a huge climate change conference. I finished my talk, people come charging up, what was that word you said? And I assumed it was the spelling bee special mycorrhizal, which very one in 500 people can spell apparently. Uh, but it wasn't. That wasn't the word. It was the word humus. Someone said, that's a chickpea dip, isn't it? And I said, no, that's hummus. Uh, and, and I realised I'd been asked to do a TED talk and I hadn't chosen a t subject and I realised that needed to be my subject if people are giving up their weekend to complain about a lack of action on climate change and they don't understand the most important single thing, then I needed to talk more about humus. So humus is a sweet-smelling chocolate-coloured substance produced by microorganisms that becomes their home base it becomes their support system. It's the only thing in the soil that can hold everything. Clay holds positively charged minerals, humus holds positive and negative. Leachable things like nitrates are held by humus. We're gonna stop nitrate leaching, we've gotta build humus, the only thing. Nitrates, humus is the nitrate storehouse, humus is the sulfur, so humus is the boron storehouse. These negatively charged minerals are only stored by humus in the soil. But humus is also the storage medium for the microbes that created this, this, their home base. And of course, there's a microbe, as we mentioned, behind every mineral. It's our greatest water management tool. We talked about the inefficiency of large bodies of water in heat wave conditions, but look at these figures. 1% increase in organic matter means that your so soil can hold 170,000 litres of water that it couldn't hold previously. You don't get more efficient than that. There's no evaporation. There's no carbon footprint. The plan takes it from that sponge called humus as it requires it. There's nothing more efficient. So I'm talking here about the fact that at some point quite soon you're going to get paid carbon credits, where well you are in some instances already, to build humus, but understand the win-win scenario. It's the dawn of the golden era of agriculture for the fact that you're going to be have a, have a secondary income stream to do the very things that make you... The National Bank said, OK, we've got people wanting to get bigger or get out, the dominant mantra in agriculture, and they're borrowing money. They come in and say, can we borrow money? And so we tick all the boxes, yes, you qualify. Too many of those loans have fallen over. Let's revisit what determines profitability in agriculture. And to the absolute surprise of the researchers, on 800 farms in the Hilston region for three years of research with the CSIRO and two catchment management authorities, to the shock of everyone, the number one determinant from here to the roof of bay behind number two was not the amount of MPK, the size of your tractor, your marketing skills, your accounting skills, could be any of those things. It was the percentage of organic matter in your soil. They actually put a value on the soil for every 0.15% increase in organic matter uh, in that soil. There is nothing more important than organic matter for your profitability, and you're going to get paid to put it there. That is a really nice story. Humus improves the nutritional value of our of our, soil, of our food. It's the primary vehicle for mineral delivery and storage in the soil. It reduces chemical contamination, and you might say it's a bit dramatic with the kid eating the apple, but look at the New York Times Dirty Dozen list where they look at 189 crops and they monitor and determine uh, which is the most toxic, and apples have topped it for 17 years straight, so fair reason to have an apple there, and a good reason to look for an organic apple for your kid's lunchbox. 
Um, but what we see in the 59 countries we work with, teams of agronomists in each country, is the higher the humus levels, the less that soil needs chemical intervention. Humus is a huge driver of soil and plant re resilience. It also prevents nitrate leach leaching. And you know, if you understand this huge parallel between your system and the soil, and they're hugely linked. We used to think of ourselves as a sack of cells, essentially, and a whole separate thing called a soul. You know, 10 trillion cells, a sack of cells walking around, communicating thousands of times a second and allowing us to be our physical body. And then we understand that we've got this 30-foot tube that runs between our mouth and our anus that contains 100 trillion of these. There's actually more of them than there is of us. And they determine every aspect of our health, including our mental health. A study about to be published next month on manic depression they, took, they, they nuked the entire system of long-term manic depressive patients and they replaced their gut, their, their gut organisms with a brewed-up version, it's called faecal transplants, a brewed-up version of a bomb-proof person who you pay 400 bucks a poo, I don't know how you describe your job, but, um, and, and, and this ridiculous, you'll see the published paper, over 80% cure rate of long-term manic depression change, the, they talk about the gut being the second brain, chickens, at the conference I was recently at. 50 chickens, one champion. More than an egg a day. You can't give it coccidiosis if you put it in the water, which is the largest killer of chickens. They nuke the 50, 49 other chickens, which means a whole series of antibiotics kill everything, you've got nothing. In this case, they just put the poo of the champion and you've got 50 champions. You don't think that might be the future of things to come in agriculture? Watch this space. But the key thing is to recognise that this life within in our, in our system looks after their host, us, in much the same way as this army of organisms beneath the roots does the same thing for the plants above. And many of the substances that are produced are actually identical. Eight of the B vitamins that our gut organisms produce for us are actually plant growth stimulants produced by microbes to support the plant above them. Uh, and so we need to start looking after those things. And so you wouldn't pour back chlorinated water on, a, on, this, on this life within, perhaps. Uh, and so you might run your water through a carbon filter. That's what humus is in the soil. It's a massive carbon filter isolating heavy metals and chemical residues so they don't enter our food chain. So I better keep moving here. I think I've overdone my time. Uh, so that's the story of humus. And, we'll, and we, of course, we'll talk tomorrow about how we can build humus, 10 strategies, uh, that proven strategies to increase this all-important profit-building substance that can save the planet, but reducing chemicals. So again, it's about getting back to root causes. The largest killer on the planet remains heart disease, a black caviar, or should I say a wink's nose leak behind cancer, and it will take over in September this year. The third largest killer, I want you to hear this, the third largest killer is prescription medicine, just took over from stroke, which is now the fourth largest killer. There's something horribly faulty about our medicine becoming our fourth, third largest killer. There's, there's a fatal flaw in that model. The agricultural model, every year for 10 decades, we pour more and more chemicals into the scenario. Last year, 14.7% increase. The year before, 142 The year before that, 13.9%, 13.6%, 13.2%. Every year, more, but wait for it, every year globally, more and more pest and disease. Do you understand that that's the definition of the word unsustainable? Put more and more on for less and less response. That's what we're doing. We do need to look at other ways. So if we're going to say what kind of other ways, well, I took for four days on that in my courses, but just simple things, real basic things. Just think about it from a simple logic perspective. How does the fungal disease attack your zucchini? How does a powdery? It drives its hyphae through the cell wall to get into the yolk in the centre. How does the sap-sucking insect does the same? It's got to chew through a substantial cell wall to get to the food source. So the obvious thing is, well, what determines the strength of that cell wall? How can we buckle the hyphae? How can we wear off the mandibles off the sap sucker? And that's two minerals. Some of this stuff's real basic, but people are not doing it. Two minerals govern cell strength, calcium and silica. And we do soil tests, we do leaf tests. Leaf tests are so basic and none of you are doing it. Leaf tests are just saying, what do you want, plant? Oh, that's what you want. Okay, here it is. I mean, how can you not do better when you ask that question? They often have no relationship to, to soil tests because minerals are not islands. A high level of nitrogen, which is the most overused and abused of minerals, here's the story. If you look up Professor Don Huber's book, Pre Pre Nutrition and Plant Disease, you'll find that the largest single cause of disease and insect pressure is nitrogen. Too little, too much, nitrate, ammonium, and the timing for that nitrogen, number one. Number two is potassium. 
Number three is calcium and number five is boron. When you overdo nitrogen, because no minerals in Ireland and nitrogen has three principal antagonists, first cave off the rank when you overdo nitrogen, you start down the most expensive of all minerals, potassium, which is the second biggest link to pest and disease pressure. Then you shut down calcium, the third biggest link. Now nitrogen is overdone, it's the first, second and third. You just shot yourself in both feet and you started on your knees at this point when you don't understand how to apply nitrogen. And you need to understand that. So we need to build cell strength and we find now that silica, which was just a, not even considered an essential nutrient, there have been nine international silica conferences in the last 11 years. Silica is huge and what's exciting about it is not just because it's an equally important with calcium for strengthening that cell wall and giving you that physical barrier against both disease and insects, but we now recognise, as of the most recent South African, and I was there, uh, the silica is a, a really powerhouse immune elicitor. And what's exciting about anything that boosts immunity is that it boosts yield. And that's what you want. Of course, you're dealing with a plant that has 4% silica that is silica dependent. And it's another thing that needs to be addressed in this industry. So just wrapping up, let's just talking about silica. Um, building microbial biodiversity. You've got to understand how important this little guy is. I ask in seminars across the world, I had 2,000 in my last talk to grape growers in India, and, I, and I, you asked in huge rooms in some instances, how many of you have got, I'll ask you that question, because some of you have been doing these good things and maybe it's changed. How many of you have got significant numbers of earthworms in your soil? So it's not many, it's about seven out of 150 of us, and maybe eight, I might have missed some. You've got to understand what that means. It literally is the intestines of the soil. But this guy, this, this stuff that he's producing up here, for one thing, if we're going to talk about humus, the fastest known creator of humus is the earthworm, four times faster than any other known way. How, does that, how important does that creature become when humus saves the planet? It's massively beyond comprehensive important in that context. And this guy comes up and drops this each night, as he takes a bit of dead organic matter and converts it to humus, and that stuff there is 10 times more potassium, seven times more nitrogen. Uh, the list goes on, on, on right down to calcium, which of course is the most abundant mineral, and you say, how could you have 150% more calcium in this stuff? Because he's got a calciferous gland. You've got a fertilizer factory and a lime works in one when you can bring back, and oxygen, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to run a spiked roller to oxygenate your soil you've got the perfect scenario. He produces, incubates in his gut a unique group of organisms, quite, a, quite an army of organisms that only comes. If you haven't got them, you haven't got them. That's why worm juice has become this huge fertilizer. In this conference in Christchurch, where the Victorian no-till is 400,000, when I was in Saskatchewan, where we deal with, we have growers accounting for 2 million hectares in one room, uh, when I'm speaking there, they'll talk about the results they get by liquid injecting worm juice, and that's because it's, 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 there's nothing quite comparable to the organisms they create. They don't have enzymes. They create organisms to do their digestive work. You haven't got them. You haven't got these nitrogen fixes, phosphate solubilizers, potassium solubilizers, disease protectors, nutrient deliverers that they incubate. And that's why they are oh, multiple reasons why they're so important. So we talk about key ratios. I might talk about some of those tomorrow. We're on to a new slide here now, if we can just change that slide. Um, we talk about key ratios and we'll talk about some of them. If we can try and maximise, we talk about leaf testing and we talk about trying to achieve luxury levels of four minerals, the four most important minerals for photosynthesis. And we'll talk about those as well tomorrow. Um, and I think we're pretty much done. In fact, we are. Uh, I've overdone my time. I trust there's been something of value. Do you want to hear a joke to soften things up a bit?